Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. Today in Dave's Garage, we're doing some vibe coating. I was actually just going to do sit here, sit here and do some coating, and then I thought, why don't I narrate what I'm doing and show you what I'm doing instead of writing a story about it later, and then you can see it live and you can see how the sausage is made. So you'll get random things like my truck beeping for no reason, and uh, production quality is going to be what it is, but uh, let's dive right on in. Now, how do I increase the editor font size in this damn thing? I can never remember. That's the whole thing. I don't want the whole thing. Editor. Well, a lot of frickin' da. Control Shift Notepad plus sign. Zooms in the font. Now you might see this and say, "What are you doing, Dave? What do you got so many games of Tempest?" Well, what it's doing is it's training an AI on how to play Tempest. So it's doing it basically by trial and error, and as the model evolves and plays more, it gets better and better at predicting what the player should do in order to survive and prosper. This is about as far as it gets. It's still pretty good. It gets through about 33 levels. It gets through all the blue levels in Tempest and then through all the red pulsar levels. But once it gets to the yellow levels, the action's too fast, there's too much, there's too much happening, and it dies off rather quickly. So I need to be able to either tweak the reward function in the AI in order to encourage more cautious behavior or perhaps tweak the expert system in order to show it examples of more cautious behavior. And I'm not sure which way I'm going to go yet, but... Uh, this is the basic system. What this window over here called Tripper is, it's a Threadripper 96 core. Well, let's take a look. So it is a 96 core machine with 192, whoops. Uh -huh. Burned by my own, burned by my own nonsense. 192 threads. What do we got for memory? 384 megs of cache. 512 gigabytes of RAM. So it's quite the machine. And it's about 25% busy playing all these uh, instances of Tempest. Each one uses less than about a full CPU core because it's running uh, unthrottled so that it's trying to run as fast as it possibly can as well. So they should be almost running busy, but they don't use quite a full CPU each. And so the basic layout of what's going on here is there are Tempest instances and they all report to a master AI server. And so 60 times a second or 30 times a second or whatever rate it's running at, the game takes a snapshot of its memory, makes that available to a Lua script. That script runs and extracts all the interesting things out of memory that it can find out. And some of them are summarized here in this uh, display in the blue window here, which might be hard to read because it's a fairly small font. There, that's a little better for you. Um, basically what we've got going on here is it extracts the game state, like what level you're on and how many lives you have left and what the status of the game is whether you're currently alive, whether you're pressing fire, whether you're pressing zap, what you're doing with the spinner, what type of level you are on, the shape, and then all the enemy information, how many of each enemy are available on the screen or how many are pending, and then a whole bunch of information about where those enemies are, where the shots are on the screen, where the pulsars are on the screen, and that kind of thing. I actually have about 350 things that I extract from the game, and I'm only passing about 200 of them right now to keep the model a little simpler because I'm trying to get it to learn faster and get past these levels. And I don't think it needs the pending enemy information yet, which are the little red dots that swirl at the end of a tube. It needs to be able to solve these levels before it needs to worry about that kind of thing. So I'm keeping it simpler for now. Alrighty, let's see. What do we got here? We changed the start level to 33. That's why we're up on yellow. We're artificially forcing it up high. So the reward function is basically the measurement of how good you did this frame. I look at the state of the game and I look at what you're doing or what the AI is doing with the control inputs and I score that state. So if you're about to die because you're in a pulsar lane with a shot right on top of you and you haven't moved and you're not doing anything, you'd get a penalty of negative reward probably. But if you were playing well and one of your shots just hit an enemy you'd get the points for that enemy plus if you were evading fuse balls you would get points for that if you're evading pulse errors or, or staying out of a pulsar lane you'd get points for that and so this is the reward function that kind of ranks and scores a frame of tempest so first thing we do is check are you alive and what is the score delta what was the score last frame what is it this frame and i look at that and i realize well hey that's the difference so you must have just scored those points right the only thing I do is I don't do any points over 2,000 because Tempest awards these huge bonuses for starting on a high level and completing it, and it would really skew the reward function. So any big rewards, I just eat them. But if you were actually shooting enemies and doing good things in the game, you do get those points. 
I like to encourage having shots on the screen, but not too many. You don't want to have all eight active because it means you don't have any in reserve. But if you have less than eight active and you're pressing fire, I give you a, well, maybe this should be less than seven actually. Because I'm giving you a reward for having the shots active, but I want you to learn to keep one in reserve. So I'm going to say less than seven. And that way, if you've got all eight going, you don't get rewarded for it, but you can do it. Now, a smart man would stop right here, test this. Does it make a difference? Unfortunately, to test it, I need to run about 50 million frames to get really good results and statistically valid results anyway. And that takes about half a day. And so every I can't afford to, every time I make a small change, stop for half a day and go do something else while Tempest trains. So... I tend to make multiple changes and then I screw myself because I don't know what changed. Maybe I made a good change and a bad change and they evened out. Maybe I made two bad changes. Maybe I made two good changes. I will, won't will ever know because I don't do it all independent. But I try to keep things isolated enough that, you know, I'll work on the reward function here for a little while. Then we'll run it for a long time and see what happens. But I'm not going to test each and every tweak to the reward function as I probably should. All right, so if you're in the game and you're actively playing, which is a state four, meaning you're not going down the tube or something else is going on, and your super zapper is active, I penalize you fairly heavily, 500 per frame. And the reason is, I don't want you to use your super zapper until you do it in a way that's either gonna save your life or give you enough points to make it worthwhile. So next we pull out a few important variables here. The target segment, which numbered segment of the tube, is the most important enemy that we should be targeting where are they located and this is an absolute number 0 to 15 and I forget doesn't matter which is 0 and which is 15 it just as long as it knows right so target depth is where how deep in the tube that enemy is and player segment is what segment you were on if there's a pulsar in the lane this will be true but we're gonna start off with false so we're gonna run through there's only seven possible active enemies and if the enemy is a pulsar and it's in your segment and the enemy depth is greater than zero, which is a good indication that the enemy is now active and not just pending. Then we say there's a pulsar in this lane, and the depth is at the enemy depth for that pulsar, or for that enemy. If there is a pulsar in a lane, and you didn't do anything, that's bad. Oh, yeah, this is not zero, sorry. So if you uh, did move the spinner, I reward you based on uh, proximity of the pulsar, which is probably... Let's have the... Uh, AI vibe code for us for a moment here. So I'm going to tell it in the selected code don't use a proximity scaler for the pulsar reward. Since the depth of a pulsar is not relevant to its lethality, it should be a flat value instead. Say 150. All right, AI, do your magic. All right, so reward for fleeing plus 150, reward for staying minus 150, and it took out its proximity reward, so I'm going to say keep that, baby. And that really simplifies it. Could I have written that code myself? Yes, I could have. All right. If spinner commanded is not zero, meaning we're moving somewhere or attempting to move somewhere, we're going to check to see, are we going to move into a pulsar lane? Because that would be bad. Is open is whether the level is one of the open ones, like, you know, a V or whatever that is open at the top. Or if it's not open, it's closed, like the circle level that we're currently on here in this window. All right. So we have a determination of whether this is an open level or not. And if you have, in fact, commanded a spinner value, which is positive, which actually winds up, for reasons that are too complicated to explain right now, decrementing your segment number, this means you're going to go counterclockwise. So a positive spinner takes you counterclockwise. If it's open and you're already above lane zero, then you can go down one lane. Otherwise... It's a closed level. Yeah, so let's make sure you don't go below zero. And this one is wrapping it around. Same thing for the other direction. 
So we know what our next segment is going to be, where our spinner is going to take us. And assuming that's valid, we look in there, if it's a pulsar, and that's the next segment, and it's active, yeah, 250. Let's make it worse. Let's make it 500. Totally arbitrary. But it doesn't seem to be avoiding pulsars quite as much as I would like, so let's make it more obvious to it. All right, charging fuse ball in lane. This is if, let's see if you saw this guy just zoom up the tube there. By the yellow levels, they come shooting out and they come right up to the top and kill you. They don't go back and forth for a while first or say hello or anything. So we have to be pretty sensitive about staying put when one is charging right at us. And so that's what this code is going to aim to do. And we have already in other code calculated if a fuse ball is in a charging mode and if it's in a segment and if so, what segment and so we have a table of charging segments. But I want to look into this. Where are these populated? Okay, here we go. This is for each of the enemies. If it's got a valid segment and it's got a depth and it's a fuse ball and it's moving towards us, then we say that fuse ball is in a charging mode and we record its segment. So if a charging fuse ball is in the lane, then we do do proximity here and it does make sense to do so because they are in fact more dangerous when they are closer. Now we're going to reward fleeing from enemy shots. So we take the shot segments and the shot positions and we walk through them and if the segment is in your segment and the position is above a danger threshold, which where do we define that? B0. Am I crazy or do shots get smaller as they fly? Because generally depths start deep and go shallow. So player's shot position, that's the, my shots. Where's the enemy shots? Enemy shots. Yeah, see, they're getting smaller. If I look at this 52 here, 96, whoops, B2, 92, 0. Yeah, so shot values positions decrease. So if it's less than shot danger threshold, then let's go make this something more reasonable, like 40 or 60. Make sure this is right. That's the AI. All right, check my code here. I've updated it by flipping the comparison and changing the threshold to 40 from a much larger value because I believe that the shot positions decrease as they get closer to the rail. I think they hit the rail at 10. I think they start as far away as F0. So is the code now correct? So now that we don't care about shots until they're actually fairly close to the player, I don't think it matters really how close they are. They're already dangerous. Get out. So I'm just going to have it do a flat reward here as well. Since we use a threshold, let's not use a proximity reward. Make it 200 penalty for remaining, 150 reward for moving. Go, go, gadget code. This is Claude Sonnet 4, by the way, which I am quite impressed with. It, and I think it has come a long way. And it's leaps and bounds above 3.7 and Gemini, which both of which were actually really good, were my favorite models until... Claude Sonnet 4 came out, and then it just doesn't make many mistakes. There's things it can't do, but it doesn't overreach. It uh, tends to generate code that compiles, and <laughs> that's a bonus. Or at least that it, you know, that runs and interprets pro properly. All right. Keep it. Let's make sure the tanker code is right. Now, these are the tanker elements that come and they drop either two flippers or two fuse balls or two pulsars. So they get up to the rail, and just before they get to the rail, they split and they drop one in each adjacent lane. And so they can be dangerous to be around. And what's the threshold here? Because that's not very close, but let's increase that. 60. I think they split at 20, so. Let's get rid of the proximity multiplier. And use the same 150, 200 scheme as the others. Should be able to figure that out. You know what I meant. So it should do. Yes, similar to the Pulsar and Shot Rewards, which I was too lazy to type, but probably should have. Anybody make it? Oh, one guy made it up to the third level of yellow. The squares are the second level, which means they've completed at least one level. No further. Meanwhile, back in AI Town. Ooh, lots of red. Why is it removed tanker depth entirely? All right, looks all right to me. What's next? Tube Zoom Reward. This all works pretty well. That's enough thrash in the code base for now. Let's uh, update everybody.
All right, so now we're going to stop all of these guys with task kill. You know you can do that? Here, check it out. Task kill slash force slash image and in the name of the process. Take it, take it from the guy who wrote Task Manager. When you want to kill a whole bunch of things, it's way handier. Because Task Manager doesn't handle multi-select in the details view yet, does it? Does it? I should not make claims. Let's try it. So I wanted to kill all the ASUS frameworks. No, I cannot multi-select. It's an outrage. But I can search, which I just learned. We'll go and delete the database file since we're starting fresh. We're going to retrain from scratch. Good night. We shall run the server. Stop our local instance. Update our source code. Oh, it didn't run. Oh, I'm in the wrong file. Doo -doo -doo -doo. I tried to run a different Pi file. There we go. Server running, client starting with new reward functions, fresh model. Let's go run to launch all of the uh, little robots. So we'll do a teapot. And then I'm going to start name 24, 24 more instances for a total of 40 plus one. All right, there's all my little yellow Tempest buddies. Now we'll let it run for a bit and we'll see what we're getting for frames per second. 3551, that's not bad. For an old desktop, well, it's not that old. <laughs> it's a year old. Thanks to Dell for providing the awesome uh, Threadripper that we were using for training and everything here because they uh, had loaned that machine to me and then I returned it after I was done with all the testing and they wanted it back. And then I was working on this AI project. So I said, have you got anything new that I could use for an AI training system? And they were kind of interested in the project. And they said, no, not yet, but... We'll send you back the uh, machine you had, which had the eight to six thousands and stuff. So that's how it came to be back. And here it is, turning out 3,500 frames a second of Tempest. Well, that's it for today in Dave's Garage. Thanks for joining me out here. If you like this kind of stuff, please actually subscribe uh, or give it a like so that I know. And uh, I mean, I'll get some sense from the view counts, but kind of like to know what people are actually thinking rather than just what they're watching. So uh, let me know in the comments and I will talk to you next time. See ya.